Uh, now time for questions and comments, but please keep comments uh, very brief such that we can collect two rounds and still be on time for dinner. We started 10 minutes late, so I'll try to go until five to eight. Who would like to kick off flip, please, please? The, the mic, the mic is behind you. Thank you. Just a quick comment for on Helen's contribution in terms of the shadow banking. Uh, don't take me wrong, I only come across this this week that there is a new, what is called leverage, leverage loans, which are provided by the banks to firms, uh, and they provide four times more than their earnings. Now, that you might say that's probably uh, usual, but no, it's, it's too much. And there is evidence that these loans are used to, pr to provide more <laughs> assets, uh, the so-called collateralized debt obligations. But most important, there are some central banks that they are extremely worried. Bank of England, IMF, mm -hmm. the ex-president of the Fe Federal Reserve System, Yellen, said, uh, you know, we have to control this development because it might create, again, the same type of problems that we had with the shadow banking during the crisis. I thought I'd just let, and if you need any numbers, mm -hmm. I can give them to you later. Thanks. Brilliant. I have Andy in my list. Thank you. <coughs> no, okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Andy Watt from the IMK. Uh, thanks for all the, uh, the great presentations. Uh, Thanks particularly, Laszlo, for enabling me and us to relive all our nightmares from the, from the last uh, uh, <laughs> 10 years. That was very considerate of you. Um, if I can try and uh, nonetheless try and give the, uh, uh, your talk a, a slightly positive twist, I mean, one of, one of the policy proposals that's still in play uh, is one that you're also associated with, uh, the idea of an unemployment uh, insurance or reinsurance scheme for Europe, as you, as you know. Uh, 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 Mr. Schultz is, is pushing this idea. We're not quite sure how successful it's going to be in getting, first of all, through the through the German cabinet. But I mean, what's your assessment of that? You, if it comes in, is it going to be strong enough to at least put a few tiles on the roof, or do you think that's now uh, uh, really just a just a, a, a sort of public relations exercise? The mm. uh, the version that's now coming out from the German government. Mm. Can we pass it back to the back to Miriam? Yeah, um, thanks a lot. We've, I think we've heard three excellent uh, analyses of what has gone wrong, or what has happened, let me put it this way, what has happened since the crisis. But the title for today, of course, what was where do we go from here? And I already tried that yesterday at the panel, I think, with mixed results asking where do we go from here? Uh, and, and specifically, I mean, for, for us as um, progressive, heterodox, uh, both Keynesian macroeconomists, um, what do you think is research that needs to be done now going forward? Mm -hmm. Okay, I have Gary and then we will do a second round uh, after the response of our speakers. Gary, please. Yes, can we have the mic to the back? Sure. We have concentrated them on <laughs> the fun part. <laughs> mic concentration. Thanks, I want to get Tom into the game. Um, let, me, let me push you a little bit, Tom. Uh, the money, that's right. And um, we are seeing this agony right now or argument amongst the Democrats with many different pathways to what people hope will be success in the midterm elections, at least to take the House. Um, do you think there's a possibility that the, the midterms uh, will result in enough of a perception that by the Democrats that they need to change horses, change approaches, that they will move, if not in a, you know, to Bernie Sanders, but at least to the idea of a candidate who won't be captured by big money. Do you think that, you know, we, we might be able to see that? Because you're tying the, the fate of that democracy to the money, and so let's just play it forward a little bit, see what's going to happen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's have our speakers respond to these uh, comments, questions, as well as to each other. 
Uh, shall we go in the reverse order, Laszlo? Is that okay for you to start first? Okay, um, and Andy was asking about um, the unemployment insurance, um, which of course is not the only important reform proposal on the table, right? So there's a long list of um, uh, reform proposals, completing the banking union, um, the ESM reform to bring it into the communitarian. So there is a long uh, 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 list, and um, it's 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 really striking that a very modest proposal of, on unemployment insurance already faces this uh, kind of resistance uh, um, in in um, at least in Germany, um, and but I don't think it's a tactical move. I think uh, what many in the political leadership, uh, at least in the SPD, uh, probably realize that uh, the, it's not only the malfunctioning of the monetary union that calls for new initiatives, but uh, the European Union is under attack uh, from the outside and also from the inside, which means that uh, you know, some new investment has to take place into creating um, economic, social, and political cohesion in the European Union. And that cannot just come from words. Um, there has to be some material uh, change. Of course, people have to develop their previous position on many issues, maybe start with something modest in order to then reach uh, something more substantial at the end of the discussion. But at least this process has uh, started. And um, I always thought that if um, the monetary union is to survive, in, um, in, in Europe, uh, such um, tools of uh, solidarity uh, will have to develop. Uh, to be honest, they should have been developed at the very start, uh, right, in order to protect the innocent, innocent victims uh, of uh, such an extraordinary experiment, but uh, better late than, uh, than never. Where do we go from here? I think um, we have to be honest that in many ways we are stuck, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and why there's been a lot of intellectual development and the wide epistemic community developing on EMU reform and many issues, um, the political process is either much slower or sometimes going to a different direction, sometimes taking a, 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 a diversion. But there are many many issues for um, discussion. In my view, if I can just extend it. The question is not simply how the EMU needs to be corrected or completed, it's the whole business model in Europe which needs to be rethought. Um, what I mentioned, the role of the public banks um, is, in my view, something very interesting where research and practice uh, can move ahead, but, 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 but further issues like um, the potential in a, in a, 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 a wider uh, social economy, for example, or um, um, uh, boosting uh, um, a kind of innovation-centered development model um, in, in Europe, also by using the European Union budget. A lot of beginnings are um, actually uh, opened up uh, to these directions. The question is whether these can be strengthened and boosted um, or, or we ignore them. Okay, brilliant. Tom. Can we continue with you? Um, I don't know, can I get this thing even to work? Yeah. Does this thing work? Yes, it yeah, is. Okay. Um, well, I wasn't asked a couple of those questions, but I actually want to comment on them. And I want to begin by observing the other side of the discussion of the uh, 10th anniversary of Lehman. And that was the discussion that burst out. It came first, actually, a year ago in the Per Jacobson lecture by Tim Geithner. Then there's a Group of 30 report that popped out more or less contemporaneously with the uh, 10th anniversary. And then there were Paulson, Bernanke, and Geithner all talking about this right at the time. They're essentially telling everybody who will listen, um, we need a much bigger bailout capacity for the world economy. Now, I've had a few discussions with various parts of central banks. And in one case, uh, one, let's say, real close to Chicago, where there's a mercantile uh, exchange of colossal, they finally sort of just said to me, well, what we really want is the bailout capacity in 15 currencies. 
Now, and that's what folks actually are thinking uh, there. And so you have folks effectively telling you you need a much larger bailout capacity than you exist. You know, to which you know many of us would say, like, what? Uh, but there it is. That's also, I think, now I actually think much of this is about the question of the swap lines, which becomes, the problem for the average central bank is it can't make dollars, and most of the loans in the world are in dollars, as Elena observed. Um, and so the way you get dollars in a pinch is with swap lines, and the sort of uncertainty that I think the Trump administration has introduced uh, and it is quite, what will happen, will they do what they did 10 years ago and simply open up all the swap lines? My guess is, in fact, they probably would do that, but um, it's sort of like an unbreakable phonograph record. You believe it's unbreakable, but you don't throw it on the floor to find out, and it's sort of like this is not an experiment one wants to run, but you need to pay attention to this because this, this, this discussion is very active in international uh, financial circles. On the question of keeping the Eurozone open, I, I would like to observe that I don't, here we don't need so much new research. In my opinion, the question's been clear. It was laid out very wonderfully in an article in the Cambridge Journal of Economics by Luigi Passanetti back before they uh, did uh, the, the actual monetary union happened where he just says you can't do this with deficit rules like that. You need an integrated recycling um, mechanism on a large scale. And the truth is, is that nothing is going to work to keep the Eurozone alive except turning it into a real, um, I hesitate to use the word country, I understand that's <laughs> loaded, but it's going to have to function like the United States, not like uh, it does now. And you can, I mean, what gets pathetic about this discussion is you sit there and adults tell you if you could, you know, let's just do the deposit uh, insurance or the in unemployment union. What they're actually doing is cutting down their demands to the size of what they think is politically palatable. None of that stuff will work. I mean, it's the same type of thing. I watched Hillary Clinton do this in 2016. She would not sort of directly pick up much on the the fact that lots of people were working at low wages, had no prospect of ever getting into the middle class, the, the ongoing decline uh, of jobs, and what I'm tempted to call it, since this is a German audience, the heartsification of a large chunk of the economy. Instead, they'd give you three and four point plans, talk about how we want to help families and all that junk. Now, you got to really face the issue squarely. If you don't, you're gone. I do think that uh, people are just, there's a strong delusory streak uh, in the European Union thinking about this. And the, enem the real enemies of the European Union are many of the folks who claim to be defending it uh, and all their deficit rules and not willing to sort of face the fact about how real economies actually can work over the long period. Now, finally, to just pick up on your question about the Democrats, here's what's going to happen in my opinion, and I claim to be able to read this like a book. Um, you could see, we all know, uh, thanks to, I'm not telling you this was wonderful, but it is true, uh, that the, say the Democratic National Committee uh, was working hard against Bernie Sanders. We all know this now. Um, and uh, the truth is they haven't really changed their attitude towards Sanders one bit. But they all looked at those elections, particularly the one in Queens, uh, where the lady actually defeated a, a, a self-professed and true, uh, nothing fraudulent about her, um, uh, ran as a socialist and defeated a congressman sitting there for years and years, a potential next Speaker of the House sometime, maybe. Um, that What I read the Democratic leadership is doing right now uh, is they think they can swallow that movement. They thought the exclusion of it, the way they tried to push Sanders out, doesn't work. They're afraid of a turnout situation um, in that they need what they think of as the enthusiasm. There's most of the Democratic electorate is not. Women have become highly energized, and you all know why. Um, and, you know, if you're a Latino or Latina, you're energized, and you know why. There's nothing like the President of the United States heaping scorn on you to sort of get you to maybe turn out. 
But in general, trying to turn people out is not such a, wonder, uh, a wonderfully certain thing. And they want to tap that energy that, the, in effect, what is happening as a socialist base uh, is developing in the United States, mostly out of people who didn't live through the Cold War. Um, and also, they're people with good educations facing the dual economy, the fact that there's no reasonable way into the middle class for them. That's happening in New York on a colossal scale um, and elsewhere. Uh, and people know it. And I, I myself think the U.S. system is so dysfunctional that it might be actually disadvantageous to as much as, say, 90 percent of the population because people have children and they can't provide for them. Uh, like that, and they all know it. But that's, that's a long argument. I'm not trying to make it. So the answer to your question is, no, there's no unity in the Democratic Party. Uh, the folks, one person is, it's, it's like a cat and mouse game. The cat's going to try to swallow the mouse. Then we're all going to find out whether they can succeed or not. That's the answer. Okay, that's an open-ended answer. Oh, Helene. Yeah. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Philip for his uh, very useful comment, and then I'd like to address um, the very eminent questions raised by <coughs> Miriam on where to we go from there with regard to research. Uh, having worked for a public uh, authority for such a long time, my impression is that the international organizations are pioneering uh, uh, research, and I c somehow miss uh, innovative research coming out from the universities. For instance, with respect to the topic finance serving society, I think this is a very, very crucial uh, crucial issue. Um, the, the, some of the central banks, including the Austrian uh, central bank, is now part of a, a research network uh, looking into, let's say, how, how we can use our financial system uh, to to tackle the the transformation towards a low carbon economy, and this has uh, several aspects: financial stability aspects, but also uh, monetary policy uh, instruments uh, could be used. And I think this kind of innovative uh, thinking, uh, so a closer link of university research with the let's say the um, um, the questions that are raised. Um, um, from the economic po policy perspective uh, are, are highly appreciable. What I try to do, uh, link your question also to, to, to what I like to, um, to, to, let's say, address in, in my presentation is uh, that also with regard to uh, capital account, um, let's say, convertibility, I think uh, there is um, a lot of, of necessary research that have to, has to be done uh, because, um, and, and here I'm very much influenced by the workings of John Maynard Keynes, uh, who, who said it's, it's so important to have control over economic policy, monetary policy, and uh, in particular of the financial system. And uh, an international global monetary order uh, to organize it in a way that it, it's, it's beneficial for the countries, for the individuals, for the pe for people is, is, is extremely important. And I think uh, this is, I, I can only talk, uh, let's say, uh, in, in, with regard to my field of expertise, I think this is uh, the way I, how I would uh, address your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will just make a small commercial break uh, just uh, to address Helena's point. Uh, we always, in the cu past couple of years, have a session, actually more than one session, on ecological macroeconomics, including mm -hmm. green finance, including this year. So uh, at least uh, we are trying to converge to these crucial uh, questions uh, that institutions are asking as well. Uh, any further comments, questions, this, uh, Tom, I see there? Yes? Can we have the mic to Tom Pally? Uh, well, thank you very much for your presentation. So I have a kind of question, uh, comment slash question uh, for Tom and Laszlo. Um, Tom, your history, I think that the, the way to start this story is that the party in power when the crisis strikes is the party that initially pays, pays the price. That happens everywhere. Um, the incoming party then faces, what well, I, I like the way you frame it, the crisis test. And if it fails, it becomes the out. But this didn't work in the 19th century because there was no left, as it were. They were struggling to find it. But it's, been the it's definitely been the phenomena of the 20th century and now the 21st century 
in the, in the late 20s, Ramsay MacDonald failed the test. And then we had the, the British, and in Germany, Adolf Hitler passed the test with his uh, mili uh, military industrialization, autobahn building, and so on. So this is a dynamic that we're still playing. Now, um, uh, your hypothesis, I, 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 obviously money is tremendously important, but I want to introduce a, introduce a bit more into it. Uh, uh, you, your sort of story is that the le left parties of today failed the crisis test because of money. That, so, so this, and I think you know, if it applies, it probably applies best to Obama. I don't know that it so much applies elsewhere. I think that you've got to introduce more. The left parties of today had already failed the test before the crisis. Mm -hmm. They were cooperative with, enthusiastically cooperative with neoliberalism. And so there's something more. Yeah, and money was in play already, but there's just this phenomena of ideological capture, that, that this really is real, and that's where we fit in, and that's why, where I think yet last night's session with Buckman fits in. He's part of that ideological, in my view, this is people, I'm sorry if you're in the room, Mr. Buckman, but I, I see you part of that uh, ideological capture phenomenon. So we, yes. that's where we, we have to do some work. Now, mm. here's the point, that, the, the question for both of you. Uh, the right is now in, the left has failed in multiple situations. What causes the right to fail? Mm. Uh, I think that you want to say that it's just the presentation of a Bernie Sanders, an alternative. Well, that's probably a sine qua non, but I don't think it's enough. And here's my fear now. I think that w I think we now have neo-fascists. Not, not, they're not fascists because they're not in, they're not, it's not the uniformed movement of the 1920s but they have the same, they come up, I call it the resurrection of the fascist tradition. Bolsonaro in Brazil on Sunday, Orban, all of them. But you, uh, Trump in there too. But you now have two possibilities, and I think this is where America is actually maybe, the, uh, um, the US is in slightly better shape than Europe. My fear in, in, in what we have in the US is uh, neo-fascist neoliberals. But my great fear for Europe is that we could have neo-fascist social democrats. I think of Orban as being someone like this. So this now becomes a recreate, and then they really occupy the space that there is no way in for us if that happens. If the neo-fascists occupy that slightly social democratic space, like Adolf Hitler did in the 1930s, there's no way in for us, and it's very, very dangerous. Okay, there is a colleague in red jumper at the back. Just at the back, yes. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for the, the answers. I, I appreciated the question of, of uh, Miriam Rehm, but I'm a bit unsatisfied with the answers. Like, you know, we still don't really know where to go from here. And I would have a, a few, just a few suggestions. I mean, we have a very good diagnosis but I think we really don't go to the end of the reasoning. And we're just always saying, well, we should have an unemployment benefit and so on and so forth, and very nice recipes of measures that will never happen. And we should know it by now. It's, we're, we're not uh, in 1992, and there has been Greece 2015, so we know it's not going to happen. Uh, within the EU as it is. And uh, Mr. Ferguson said, well, the only way out would be like nothing can happen unless the EU becomes a true country. And this also won't happen. And it's even questionable whether or not it should be desir desirable, but that's another question. But it, it won't happen then what do we do? So we, we don't stop here. We, we think, what do we do? And so just a, a few suggestions for research is how can a country uh, take back policy space without breaking all the institutions existing? And I think Olivier Pisek had a good point in, in a pre paper presented today or yesterday um, to, to, to have a public bank that disobeys, like, you know, uh, the treaties, kind of, but even inside the treaties, you can have this public bank financed, financing big investments. So that's a way to play with the treaties. And another thing would be, would be if this all leads to the euro exploding, 
then we should know what, how this can happen, what to do if the euro explodes. Because people are just fearing that no up, one, yes, yes. that no one knows what happens if the euro explodes. And two friends of mine made a study on the balance sheet effects and showing that the balance sheet effects will not have a big um, impact and it will not be a catastrophe. This is also we're talking about capital flows, but uh, we need the capital flows, but we don't know how to do it. So research needs to be done on capital flows, I think. Capital this controls, is probably you meant. Capital uh, controls, sorry. Okay. Just sorry for being long, but. These are all very interesting comments and questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we will close now, so we will get uh, back to our speakers. Helene, would you like to go first? <laughs> yes, please, thank you. Um, let me just respond to, to the final remark. Uh, I, I also think that was, uh, the message I wanted to convey, that work on capital uh, flow convertibility is extremely relevant. But what I'd like uh, to mention is um, I'm not that skeptical with regard to reforms, for instance, Eurozone reforms. Uh, as I have mentioned, we are, I didn't mention, but I, in, in, in December 2000, uh, this year, the European Commission will uh, publish a communication with its own proposals on uh, how to strengthen the euro. And I think this might be a catalyst, for instance, to, to, to uh, advance in our, let's say, debates about the introduction of so-called uh, synthesized euro bonds, sovereign bond-backed securities. Just to give an example, I think there, uh, it's it's uh, and and from I think this is this would be a, a very relevant reform. It, it it's uh, the conditio sine qua non for for the success of the other reforms that are envisaged. Uh, that's just my point. Thank you. Mm, that was very succinct. Thank you very much, Tom. Okay, first, I think I made a mistake when I said like a country. What I should have said was, in the case of the European Union, recycling, fiscal recycling's got to occur on a country-like scale. Um, and you, know, you can stick around and have five, six, seven countries, but they are ultimately going to have to have a really large budget on this, the sort of thing that the United States has been doing in the post-New Deal era and that most other countries do that. And that's got to happen. It's just there's no other way around it. You can just talk until you're blue in the face. But if, if you don't have that, the system will not work. Passanetti and Alan Parguez's great piece in the Eastern Economic Journal, again before the month, they all had it straight out, and so did Wynne Godley. That's my point one. Point two, I don't believe in purely ideological capture, though for sure purely ideological stuff happens. In particular, if you look at the leaders of that capture, Tony Blair, Gerhard Schroeder, Willem Koch, uh, or Bill Clinton, you will find they all became extremely wealthy out of their doings. That's not an accident in my judgment. Um, and I, if I had time, which I don't, we could discuss some of the financing issues. The best on the British Labor Party, you can't do better than that book called Labor Party PLC, which hardly anyone seems to have read except me, but it's a beautiful study. Um, and in the other case, we, I mean, I, if somebody in Germany doesn't finally do a study of the parliamentary uh, ties of various parties and their political money, I may do it myself. I've been looking, <laughs> dabbling at this for years. But you know, um, the, when you have large-scale centered parties, meaning where they can determine that the leadership does more of the determination of money in that, then you want to look at things like speaking fees. Um, and I think we all found out, was it when Steinhardt ran for uh, chancellor and he had, a, had an enormous amount of speaking? That stuff is routine. Um, Blair and Clinton and these people really pioneered a new way for social democrat uh, or social democrat oriented types to get rich. That lesson is still unlearned by folks. Uh, so I'm afraid now I won't. And finally on fascism, I've done a lot of work on German economic history and some of you have read it. Uh, I know that. Uh, but look, the quest key question here, if you're going to see fascism, I think in the end you want to watch private armies. The, the use of uh, private extra-legal force uh, around. Now, my reading of the situation is while you can see a lot of encouragement to violence and incitement and stuff like that, that line really hasn't been crossed yet. 
Uh, there was a moment in the election when it looks like people were talking about actually having clashes. And I thought, oh, my God, we're going to be back to these various uh, private armies of the late 20s in Weimar. Uh, it didn't happen. They called it off after that Chicago clash uh, when it was still in the primary. People had some common sense in the U.S., and I don't think it's happened really in Europe, though if one of you wants to come up afterward and tell me I should look at this or that, I'll pay attention. But I'm not seeing it yet. This, I'm not telling you everything is wonderful. I'm just saying you may, things could still get so bad you may look upon now as a golden age. That is a positive remark. <laughs> Laszlo. Yes, uh, one, Laszlo. one important reference I would like to make is... Um, um, the title uh, given by Klaus Offer to one of his book, uh, Europe Entrapped. Mm. And I think this is pretty well um, um, uh, you know, providing a, a, an image and an explanation of where we are in um, this um, halfway uh, house uh, where uh, there is very little political um, capital to move forward, but um, moving backwards would be an even greater political failure which uh, uh, all the different, um, in general, pro-European uh, tendencies um, cannot afford. It doesn't um, uh, give you any kind of illusion that things can improve quickly. That's why the image of uh, the trap. Uh, nevertheless, I think the experience uh, shows that in, in many rounds of this story, which I also summarized here, um, things um, occasionally happened when there was a big enough crisis and um, when there was at least a second best suggestion on offer. Let me give you an example. Um, I didn't put it in the top 10 because you know the top 10 is a very short list. Uh, but in 2011, October, the commission published a so-called roadmap, how to tackle the crisis. You probably remember the famous roadmap. And there was an interesting supplement to that um, a, a, a green paper to discuss so-called stability bonds because uh, it was an idea of various types of the euro bond, but in order to sell it in Berlin, you have to say stability bonds. Um, of course, it bounced back from Berlin even so, but why was the Commission proposing this? Because there was a discussion before, and of course, people who knew the political landscape were considering what has the better chance to fly uh, a proposal on euro bond, mutualization of the debt, or encouraging the European Central Bank uh, to do more. And someone who knew Germany very well suggested that, look, the Central Bank should not be touched because it's sacred for the Germans. They will never accept that the European Central Bank is doing more. Now, two weeks later, the opposite was happening. Um, the proposal on stabili stability bond, which would have been a very transparent solution otherwise, uh, was shelved uh, for a very long time. And then the European Central Bank had, had to come forward. Of course, it wouldn't have done what, what, what it could without the political authorization and eventually also the legal protection of, um, uh, of, of its actions from all different sides, including even Karlsruhe. So um, it, it, it in a way shows that, uh, yes, this Europe is not going to be the first best because the post-Keynesian economists cannot just uh, tell the decision makers what to do. Um, but it's, um, it's developing as a Europe of second best. There is always a second best or a third best solution, which somehow is sufficient for muddling through, but still better than allowing the whole uh, construction to, uh, to collapse. Um, the center left, I would agree with both sides that the failure starts earlier. I would not take sides on why it was happening for purely ideological or intellectual weaknesses or, 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 or the material uh, causes. There is also probably a, 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 a sociological explanation of this transformation of the center left. So it's, a, I think, a very complex story. But, but you know, when the crisis was happening, um, the Social Democrats had Eurobond and FTT on the flag. Uh, don't forget. So there, there were some very concrete proposals or even demands at this stage. And it would be also very interesting to investigate why these EU-level uh, proposals, which were advocated for some time uh, by people like uh, you know, Paul Niro Rasmussen, that time the president of the European uh, Socialists, um, uh, allowed to uh, disappear in the great, um, very pragmatic 
process of uh, muddling through.